Welcome everyone to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. As a communication coach, trainer, speaker, and author, I'm delighted to be your host and excited to bring you insights and ideas to help you solve your communication conundrums. This is the 46th episode of my show, Partner Up with Amy Carroll. If you want to find out more about me or what the show's about, feel free to listen to previous episodes on my website, carolcoaching.com, or go directly to the voiceamerica.com business channel. Download the app or tune in using your favorite podcast app. If you missed last week's show, I interviewed Rajkumari Neoji. She's an epigenetic coach and executive consultant, and Rajkumari helps us to see and understand why a sense of belonging is critical to feeling happy and for being productive. Rajkumari also offers us straightforward practices for dismantling toxic work cultures. Be sure to check out that episode from July 9th. Today, my guest is Terry Real. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. Yeah, same here. And you and I were talking a few minutes before. I didn't get to tell you how I first came across you. So three, four months ago, I was attending a communication weekend training online on nonviolent communication, one of my passions. And I attended this workshop by Dr. Yvette Erasmus, who's a psychologist, who took your courses and she, she raved about you during this session. I was like, okay, I got to find out who this guy is. And that was the beginning of learning about you. And then obviously it, I took a deep dive into your, one of your books. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's nice that the nonviolent communication people are recognizing uh, there's a lot of overlap between my work. A and lot these. of overlap. Absolutely. I have a lot of respect for them. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to tell the listeners some background on you so they can appreciate uh, more about where you come from and where we're going to be going today. So Terry Reel is a nationally recognized family therapist, author, and teacher. He's particularly known for groundbreaking work on men and male psychology, as well as his work on gender and couples. In private practice for over 30 years, Terry's often appeared as the relationship expert for Good Morning America and ABC News. His work's been featured in media venues such as Oprah 2020, The Today Show, CNN, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Psychology Today, and many others. In 1997, he published the national bestseller, I Don't Want to Talk About It. And this was the first book ever written on the topic of male depression. That was followed by the book, How Can I Get Through to You? An Exploration of the Role of Patriarchy in Relationships. And then most recently, and this is how I first came to learn about Terry uh, when, after reading the book, The New Rules of Marriage, What You Need to Know to Make Love Work, a practical guide for couples and for couple therapists. In addition to all that, Terry founded the Relational Life Institute, and this offers training programs for therapists along with workshops for couples and individuals. Now, Listeners, what you don't know, which I just found out about only moments ago, is that Terry's got a new book coming out next March. Now, Terry, I would love for you to give us an insider scoop on this book, the title, or I maybe you only have a working title now, I think, though. Let's hear about that first. Um, it's an interesting story. I, uh, I wanted to write a book of just clinical vignettes, just clinical stories, because I write them and I love writing them. And uh, I shopped a book proposal and no one wanted it. And then I thought I was done as a writer. I've written four books and, you know, uh, okay. And then uh, out of the blue, the folks from Goop, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's organization that I've done a lot of work for, uh, emailed me and said that they're uh, opening up a new uh, imprint as part of Random House. And they're inviting a couple, three authors a year. Uh, and would I like to write a book for them? And I said, okay, sure. <laughs> well, you and, know when to say yes, Terry. That's good news. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what evolved was uh, it's sort of the culmination of my life's work, to be honest. Um, it's a, it, The book is called Us, U.S., Us, how moving beyond moving relationships beyond you and me creates love, passion, and understanding. And it's about it's really a critique of the idea of the individual. I start off with the neurobiology of uh, uh, of our 
relationships and the idea that um, the notion of uh, human beings as freestanding individuals is bullshit. We're not freestanding individuals. We're not neurologically freestanding individuals. We human beings co-regulate each other all the time. This is why when you break up with somebody you've lived with for a long time, you feel that hole in your body. It's like physical. It's yes. because your neurology is out of, it, it, it's looking for your partner to help regulate you in the usual ways. And they're not there and you're kind of haywire. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things I say, Amy, is if you want to really look at the effect of being a total individual on somebody, uh, look at what solitary confinement does to yeah. people. We're not designed. We are designed to be relational. We are yeah. designed to be intimate. That is our birthright. It is the pearl of great price. It is the only thing that's going to make us happy. Yeah. And so the book us is really about how to teach people to stop thinking like individuals asserting their rights, God damn it, and uh, start thinking relationally in terms of the ecological whole. Now, the only caveat in that is women because it's part of the traditional setup for women that they don't think of themselves as individuals, but think in exclusively of serving their partner and the relationship. And that's not what I'm talking about. That's Got a step it. backward. Yeah. So I talk about three phases. The first phase of our evolution uh, is what we were talking about earlier, the perpetrator victim. Yes, uh, And it's about power and it's about patriarchy and it's about individualism and it's about male white power specifically. And it's abusive. The, the primary relationship, the template for relationships is one in which there's an asymmetry of power and liberties are taken uh, by whoever's on the masculine side of the equation. And uh, the second phase is when the disempowered woke up 50 years of feminism. And I consider myself a feminist family therapist. I yeah. have for 50 years. And it took the dispossessed and said, here, a fine voice. And what people moved into is what I call personal empowerment. I was weak. Now I'm strong. Go screw yourself. Get out of my way. Right. And I believe the next step, and that's what the book is all about, and my work is all about, is what I call relational empowerment. I was weak, now I'm strong. Let me bring my full strength into this relationship and empower you, my dear love, to come through for me in the ways I want you to because we're a team. Let's mm -hmm. stop talking and thinking to one another as if we were adversaries in a zero-sum win-lose game. Yep. And let's start looking at win-wins that work for both of us. And when you stop thinking about limited resources in a win-lose power struggle, and you replace that with the humility and the wisdom of knowing that you are not outside of nature, including your marriage, your kids, your your body, your thinking, we, we are control freaks. We yeah. try and control our bodies. We try and control our thoughts. We try and control our feelings. We try and control our kids. We try and control our partners. Good luck. So this is about giving up the dysfunctional model of control and uh -huh. replacing it with a model of interdependence and collaboration with ourselves, with nature, with our families, with society, with other races, and with the planet at large. We will move out of dominance into a model of interdependence and cooperation, not just theoretically, but practically. These are yeah. the steps and how to handle yourself. We will learn this technology, or I fear, honest to God, yeah. we will die. Yeah. The, the the fate of our planet is on the line. I yeah, really believe that. Yeah, it literally is. And Terry, that last part you just said really reassured me because when you were talking about this, I, I was noticing, oh, I'm feeling overwhelmed and 
and the, you know, the question how, and then you said practically. And after reading your book, The New Rules of Marriage, and mm -hmm. seeing how it's filled with insights and highly applicable, doable, clear exercises, I have a level of confidence that this next book will be able to offer us a similar approach. Yeah, so, thank you. Can, can I give you one example? Yes, please. Uh, I want to give your, your listeners a tool or, or a way of thinking. Okay. Uh, the, to me, is a really good illustration of moving from our normal, patriarchal, individualistic, linear way of thinking to a humble, relational, wise way of thinking. Okay. When we are faced, either in the business setting or personal, what it, when you're faced with an unhappy person in relationship with you, as you're listening to that person, 999 out of 1,000 of us go to two reference points. This is what I teach over and over again. The first reference point is quote unquote objective reality. As I'm listening to you talk about how miserable you are because I didn't pick up my socks and I left the dishes and I did this with our kid and I did that with our uncle. Uh, the whole time you're talking sentence by sentence, point by point, I'm going true, not true. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, that's half right. But you have to understand I'm rebutting. Right. I'm not listening. I'm rebutting. And if I'm smart, I don't do it out of my head. Right. <laughs> you know, I want people to stop doing that mm -hmm. and to listen. Yeah. And one of the bitter pills I have, you've heard me say this, Amy, is objective reality has no place in personal <laughs> relationship. Say that's that. I want to, that's to say that one again for the listeners. That's a good one. Objective reality is useless in personal relationship. Yep. You spoke disrespectfully to me. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. <laughs> well, it so happens I had an audiologist in the table next to us, and he <laughs> measured the decibel level of the way you spoke. To me. Uh, this is what I call applying the scientific uh, method to your relationships, and it's a loser. The relational answer to the question, who's right and who's wrong, is who cares? <laughs> Doesn't matter. What matters is how are we going to work this issue out in a way that's going to work for us? That's okay. what matters. What do you need, hon? Okay, let me tell you what I need. Let's trade horses. Mm -hmm. And um, so our first orientation is how accurate is this? And, you know, if you're like me or most of the people I know, the answer is not very. <laughs> let me set you straight, honey. <laughs> The second orientation that we go to is us. I can't believe what a pain in the ass Amy's been. I have to listen to this crap yet again. We've been through this. I know I have to put up my socks. Okay. All right. My socks, leave me alone. And uh, it, what a beleaguered person I am to have to deal with a distraught partner. Okay. What I want you to do, oh, listener. And this has the power to change your lives today trade in objective reality and trade in your selfish concern and replace them with a different orientation. You want to know what it is? Yes, yes, yes. Compassionate curiosity mm. about the other person's subjective experience. Compassionate okay. curiosity about the other person's subjective experience. Right. Okay. You made me miserable, Terry, by blah, 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 mm. blah. The, the usual response, well, I didn't blah, blah, blah. I blah, right? but I didn't blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that does you no good whatsoever. How about this one? Uh, Amy, uh, I'm sorry you feel bad, honey. I don't want you to feel bad. I care about you. Tell me more about what happened. And then if you really want an A plus, you can follow that one up with, <laughs> hey, uh, is there anything I could say or do right now that would help you feel better? Gorgeous. Like a knife through butter. <laughs> butter, as we like butter, to say. Butter, <laughs> like a knife through butter. I'm sorry. I don't want you to feel bad. That wasn't my intention. I care about you. I, I'm, I'm sorry you don't feel well. Uh, is there anything I can say or do right now to help you feel better? Now, the operative phrase there is right now. 
mm-hmm. because if you tell me, well, you could, uh, well, you never, well, you, I, right. I, I, can't, I can't do anything right, right now. now. Is there something? And that's called repair. Yeah. That's the skill of repair. And one of the things you learn uh, in my work when you start living relationally is that when your partner is in a state of disrepair, yeah, this is not a dialogue. Everybody gets this wrong. Mm-hmm. This is not a conversation. It isn't, okay. well, you air your issues and then I'll air mine. No, 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 no. This is a one-way street. I'm sorry you feel bad. I don't want you to feel bad. It's not in my interest to walk around with you feeling bad. So for my own enlightened self-interest, what are we going to do to help you feel better? What are my issues with you? Well, we'll later. Right, right now, right. let's help you feel better. Right. Yeah. One of the things I say is when your partner's distraught, it's like you're at the customer service window. Okay. Somebody comes to you at the customer service window and says, my microwave doesn't work. Right. They don't want you to say, well, my toaster doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to fix their damn microwave. Exactly. Pay attention to your upset partner. Disarm them. And then you can move on to something else. Mm. But first do that. That's just one skill. I have dozens. Wow. Of them. Yeah. And it's like, and I love how you illustrated how insanely concrete that is. That is so doable for pr- the majority of the population. Maybe not every day, all the time. Maybe we have to, you know, make sure we've been recently fed and watered, though generally most of us should be able to do that and do, start to do it well only with practice. This is, are not skills we were necessarily born with, many of us. Yes, you can do this skill just as you can do all of the relational skills, but here's another bitter pill, my dear. Mm, okay, I'm ready. Um, it is only the wise adult part of you yeah. that will use any of these skills. The triggered, we call it the adaptive child part of you, the triggered part of you that's either wounded and overwhelmed yeah. or that is in your automatic knee-jerk triggered response will not use any of these skills. No. It's really important that we understand that they're different parts of us. And the part that we're using right now, talking to each other, is what I call the wise adult part of us. Right. Prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of the brain. Um, the work that a lot of people do in therapy, is, you know, kind of very famous these days, is trauma work with the wounded child part of yeah. us. Part of us that was just traumatized or neglected or abused yeah overwhelmed very young part of us terry oh go you ahead need a break? no i want to um share one thing that i uh, pulled from the book and this is yeah. i think what you're referring to when we have a reaction of either being the offended self-righteousness or that feeling like a bad person as you said that's our wounded child reacting and this is the next phrase is what i love in that moment give ourselves emergency empathy and take the wounded child's sticky hands off the steering wheel. <laughs> right. It's fantastic. Right. When, when an inner child comes up in you, which an inner child is just a sort of personified way of talking about a trauma state, an early child ego state that gets, it's arrested development. It's where you go at the age when you stopped growing because you were messed with or abandoned in some way. And when you go back to that state, you have to understand that you're in an immature state. Yeah. And this adaptive child part of us, this wounded part of us, doesn't want intimacy. Intimacy is vulnerable and scary. It wants one thing, self-protection. And so one of the great skills I teach is taking a breath, getting centered, and moving out of that triggered self-defensive, self-protective, and relaxing and opening up to the wisdom of a more mature part of your brain. You're literally in a different part of your neurology. Mm -hmm. You know, I I, I do workshops all over the country and... um, Uh, It's full of uh, slides. And my favorite slide of the workshop is uh, other workshops teach you skills. We deal with the part of you that won't use them. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, 
lot of people must just be like cringe, like, oh my God, he's talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> because you get in that triggered, adaptive, immature part of you, all bets are off. Yep. Uh, I talk about five losing uh, strategies and the adaptive child part of us is not about intimacy. Nope. It's not about making things better. It's about proving you're right or controlling the other person or ventilating and ugh, getting it all off your yeah. chest or retaliating in ways large and small or withdrawing. Those are what I call the five losing strategies, being right, control, ventilating, retaliating, or withdrawing. None of these moves will get you more of what you want, but they're no. self-protective. Yeah. And so the first order of business is when you're in a heated moment at work or in your personal life, you know, somebody came up with, wait, why am I talking? <laughs> I love that. You stop and ask yourself, what am I about here? Am I speaking to make things better? Am I speaking to somebody I care about? Mm -hmm. Or am I speaking to the enemy and I'm really trying to pound the son of a bitch into the ground? Right. Or am I proving that I'm right? Or am I getting yeah. them to do this or that? And yeah. it, 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 if you're involved in one of anything other than I speak with wisdom and humility to somebody I care about. The reason why I'm talking is to make things better between the two of us. If you're not there, take a break. Yeah. Excuse yourself. Splash yeah. some water on your face. Go for a walk around the block. Do a little inner child work. Take that little girl that's triggered and put her on your lap and have a little chat with her. But so don't let them run your relationship. Yeah, exactly. Take the hands off the steering wheel. <laughs> Right. And something that when you, in the book, you talked about the five losing strategies and something, a quote I took was from a client to her husband, you can be right or you can be married. <laughs> What's more important to ask? And the thing is, you know, one, uh, I've done a lot of self-development. One of the things I learned from one of my courses many years ago was we have, as and I'd love to hear your input, if you agree with this, two driving forces as human beings to be right and to look good. <laughs> and I don't know if they mean like well quaffed or what exactly, or you know, just to, to be able to impress people, I know what they mean. So for me, I haven't fully removed those things. And I, and I think even in the training, they said you can't actually get rid of them as human beings. Though just by us being aware of it, it then puts me to the place of choice. And I can, oh, I'm wanting to be right here. Can I keep my mouth shut anyway and not disprove that person just so I can be right? Because that's not going to solve anything. Yeah, that's okay. called recovery. Say it that's again. What recovery, that's called recovery. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> that's where recovery is, is a string of those moments. I talk about a second. There's your initial knee-jerk response. Fight, flight, or fix. Those are your knee-jerk automatic responses. They come uh, absolutely out of your childhood. They have everything to do with your role in your family. When the heat is on, fight, flight, and you can flee and be standing in front of somebody. That's called right. Stone. Yeah, freeze. I think they call that one. Yeah. Right. Or 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 fix. Let me make it. You know, like kind of codependent. Make, yeah. Let me make it all better. And um, you uh, replace that with thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. See, the adaptive child, once you're triggered, you're not thoughtful. You're on automatic. And the whole art is taking a breath and moving beyond your automatic response to something. Can I, we have two minutes. Can I tell you a quick story? Yes. And give me one minute to lead us out to break. And if you need more time, go for it. We'll just run past. Uh, Steve is my uh, generic example of adaptive child behavior. He lied. He was on the brink of divorce because he lied about everything. Okay. I take him back to his family. Who tried to control you growing up? Show me the thumbprint and I'll tell you about the thumb. If he was expert at evading, maybe somebody tried to control him. Who was he mm -hmm. evading? Sure enough, his father was all over him. What did he do? He lied. He learned to lie to his father to preserve his autonomy. Smart boy. 
I teach my students, always be respectful of the exquisite intelligence of the adaptive child. You did exactly what you needed to do back then. However, adaptive then, maladaptive now. His wife sends him to the store for five things. He comes back with four. She says, where's the fifth? He says, every muscle and nerve in my body was screaming to say they were out of it. And instead I said, I forgot. His wife burst into tears, true story, and said, I've been waiting for this moment for 25 years. Oh my gosh. That's moving beyond your automatic adaptive child response, taking a breath and deliberately intentionally reaching for something more mature and relational. That's the practice. Gorgeous. Okay, so let's take a pause here, Terry. And listeners, if you want to connect with, find out more about Terry, go directly to his website, terryreal.com. And that's spelled T-E-R-R-Y-R-E-A-L.com. And he is going to, and hopefully, Terry, before we finish the show today, you'll tell us a little bit more about your online course, Staying in Love. Now, listeners, if you want to take your superhero partner powers into the next decade, join me for my online leadership presence course. You'll find it more on my website, carolcoaching.com. When we come back from the break, we're going to be hearing more from Terry. Stay tuned. You're listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Welcome back to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. My guest today is Terry Real. We've been discussing the five losing strategies that get us in trouble. We were also talking earlier about his new book out next March, which is utterly fascinating. So Terry, I'd like to move into what people can do more of. You say that in your work, you teach men and women to be more relational. What do you mean by that? And how do you do that? Well, by relational, I mean connected. Mm-hmm. And by uh, unrelational, I mean disconnected. It's that simple, okay? Think connection. But it, it, you have to factor in gender uh, because for uh, a lot of men, uh, the issue is being disconnected from others. Uh, for a lot of women, traditionally, the issue has been being disconnected from themselves and Uh, in some ways, abdicating themselves in the service of serving the relationship and serving the other. So when I talk about moving to an ecological consciousness, I'm talking about moving into both. Um, The individual in context, it's not the individual out of context, and it's not just the relationship and not the individual. Okay, Uh, my, my pal, Uh, The great feminist psychologist Carol Gilligan has a a famous quote, you can't have relationship without voice and you can't have voice without relationship. Okay. It it has to be both. So I want women to move beyond that disempowered voicelessness. And I want them to move beyond empowered, um, how shall I put it, uh, unrelated voice. For women or for uh, men, that last part? Well, wait, 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 I'm not done. For, for women, if I may, I want uh, both sexes, but particularly women, to move into what I call soft power or loving voice. Mm-hmm. So you're powerful and you're connected at the same time. And Got I'll it. I'll double back on that. Men need to open their hearts. Men need to connect to their own feelings, particularly the vulnerable feelings under patriarchy. Most men are allowed lust and anger, and that's about it. But men need to open their hearts to their vulnerable feelings and share them with their partners. Women are lonely in heterosexual relationships. And men need to come down off of our high horse and be flexible and uh, responsive. I talk to guys about learning to become family men. And what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you a story. I tell them the story. Oh, good. Okay. My two boys are now 31 and 33, so we're out of it. But when they were babies, uh, my wife, Belinda, who's a full-time psychologist just like, with a practice just like mine, uh, you know, she'd be up feeding the, these babies uh, in the middle of the night. And one night I get the boom, 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 boom. One of the kids needs the bottle. Go get them. It's like three in the morning. And I turn to my wife and with great sincerity, I say, listen, you've been doing a great job. I really appreciate it. 
I, 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 of course I would help. I, I, but tomorrow I'm giving a lecture at the Harvard Couples Conference. I'm going to have a thousand therapists. I've got to, I, 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 I just got to be on my toes. I'm going back to sleep. Uh, at which point my wife said something to me that changed my life. You know what she said? Oh, I can only imagine. Go, tell us, please. <laughs> she said, give your lecture tired. Go feed the kid. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> but I had that um, worker uh, entitlement, uh, traditionally male entitlement. Yeah. And uh, it never occurred to me to rob my career and mm. put that energy into my family. Oh, I love that expression, rob your career. Yeah. Well, one of the things I tell both men and women these days is if you do everything that you can to further your career, you'll be divorced. Yeah. Your career will eat you up alive. Yeah. And on the other hand, if you don't do everything you can for your career, you'll watch other people have higher trajectories than yours who are willing to sacrifice their lives for their careers. Um, this is not like pie in the sky bullshit, but we all have to make our choices and live with them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a powerful story. Thank you for sharing that. For men in particular, what I want people to understand is that our our relationship is like our biosphere. This is what I mean by thinking ecologically. Okay. If one of you wins and the other one loses, you both lose. And this is not some idealistic bullshit. You lose because the loser will make the winner pay for it. Yep. Count on it. Oh, yeah. You're not, you're not separate. You're connected. So you realize you trade in the hubris of I'm above the system with the humility of I'm in the system. Mm hmm it's in my interest to keep that biosphere clean because I'm breathing it. You know, one of the things I say is you can choose to pollute your ecosystem by a, a temper tantrum over here, but you're going to breathe in that pollution with your partner's resentment and distance over here. Yep. It's, it, there's no escape. It's instant karma. And once we begin to realize that we're not disconnected, but we're very connected, you move into what I call enlightened self-interest. It's in my in happy spouse, happy house. It's in <laughs> my interest to keep my partner reasonably happy. You want to know why? Yeah, you love them. Yeah, you want what's best for them. The hell with all that. You live with them, fool. It's in your interest to keep them happy because you deal with the consequences when they're not. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, you talk about these five winning strategies to become a proactive lover and to shift into what you call second consciousness. I'd love to take a deep dive into some of those. Perhaps hear some stories that you'd like to share. Well, I want to talk. The first winning strategy is getting more of what you want in your relationship. How's that? That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a really good example of starting to think relationally. Uh, I tell people, and we may not be, have time to go over all, all the five winning strategies. Right. This, is a good, this is a good example. The first uh, stage in getting what you want in your relationship is what I call daring to rock the boat. This is where you grab your partner by the collar, you put your face in their face, and you say, look, this is really important. You're not listening. You better listen. That's the sort of aggressive uh, first phase. Once your partner is listening, uh, by the way, if you cannot get them to listen, no matter what you do, yeah, that's a kick out for couples therapy. It's yeah. obvious. People say to me, well, when do we know when we need help? When you can't deal with it on your own. That's when you need help. Like this is not rocket science. So if you cannot get through to your partner, no matter what you do, get some help from outside of the two of you. But assuming you do and they hear you, you know, when COVID hit, both my wife and I work a, a ton of hours. We're both psychologists in, in practice. I'm a social worker. And uh, 
uh, and we have a lot of help, you know, like, well, like I recommend for my two career professional families to don't squabble over mopping the floor, you know, you can afford to hire somebody to come in and mop the floor. And, uh, but when COVID happened, we couldn't do that. Right. Eight months. And, you know, I, I think we're probably the only heterosexual couple that had this, but there was a slight discrepancy in my comfort with neatness and my wife's. Uh -huh. and this may come as a great shock to you, but she was less comfortable with mess than I was. No, really? Yeah. Isn't that shocking? That's weird. Yeah. Now, <laughs> here, here, here's the moment. I could stand up for my right to be sloppy, uh, uh, although I would call it unconcerned and spontaneous. Uh, uh, or I could try and make peace in the household. It's my choice. It's my household. Okay. If I want to stand up and fight for my right to leave dirty dishes in the sink, it's my prerogative to do so. But what does it get me? Right. This is what Dip. I call keeping your wits about you, keeping your eyes on the prize, thinking yeah. ecologically. You know, nowadays, Belinda and I used to be ragers. 30 years ago, we'd fight for six, seven days on end, wake up at seven in the morning, tell other people how to live their lives all day, and then come back and start fighting again. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> we don't rage. We're in recovery. We don't rage like that anymore for 99% for awesome. of the time. Um, when we don't, it looks something like this. We'll start to squabble. It'll escalate. One or the other will take a break. We're, I'm very fond of breaks. Take a break and get yourself recentered. 15, 20 minutes go by and one or the other, and bless us, it could be either. One or the other comes in and says, uh, hey, I don't want to fight. You want to fight? I don't, I don't, I don't want to fight. I, I'm sorry. Whatever I did, I'm sorry. What, what, what do you need? Let's get out of this. And Belinda will say, well, you could say you're sorry about blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, well, geez, that's, okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay, I'm sorry. I, and I mean it. I'm sorry. Right, right, right authentic. It. Sorry, you feel bad. What, okay, so what do you need? Well, you could take responsibility for both. All right, yeah, I can be like that. All right, great. What do you want? Tea? Tea's good. Okay, <laughs> we're done. Uh, and what would have taken seven days, oh. we're done in 20 minutes. And what I'm thinking, this is really critical, what I'm thinking about when I come downstairs, it could be the other way, but I come downstairs and I say to Belinda, I don't want to fight, you want to fight? What I'm thinking about is this, everybody listen. How do I want to spend my evening? That's what I'm thinking about. Do I want to spend my evening fighting with this person? Or would I rather cuddle and watch something cool on TV and, you know, and, and pop some popcorn and have a nice night? It's up to me. Yep. And when I talk to people about standing up for themselves, which I believe in, the question you ask yourself is, what is this going to cost me? Yes. You know, if you want your kid in this school and your partner wants your kid in that school, giving in could really cost you something. Mm -hmm. But if your partner is upset with you because you left your dirty coffee cup on the counter, what does it cost you to say, I'm sorry, and wash your cup? Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of uh, standing up for yourself. And there's also a lot of yielding. Yeah. Ego and, management. And the art. Yeah. Ego. And the art is knowing when to do which. And the, the, the litmus test that I'm asking people. Yeah. Is, what's like the inner guide for that? Uh, it, what's the price? Okay. And if the price is just your stiff necked pride, then let it go and be nice. more generous. Yeah. But if it's really going to cost you something, you want to live in California and he wants to live in Chicago. All right. Then maybe you got a fight on your hands. But so many times we fight over what? Yeah. We defend what point exactly that's so damn important. Let it go. That's gorgeous. Yeah, I, I've been my own guinea pig for many years. And so uh, that's that checking in with my ego and realizing 
you know, if I give in, oh, the only thing that's dying a slow, painful death is my ego. Okay, I can live with that. <laughs> yeah, one of my chapters is from e ego to ego. Yeah. <laughs> Park your ego at the door and do what is right for everybody, including you. I, want, I can't stress this enough. I don't want women to return to uh, altruistic self-sacrifice. That's not what I'm talking about. Nope. I'm talking about enlightened self-interest. It's in my interest to end this fight with Belinda because I don't want to spend the next three hours screaming at each other. I'd rather watch a movie. Thanks yeah. anyway. Yeah. And so, you know, you talked um, in your book about there's a difference between self-defense and reciprocal attack. And, you know, we, we may be able to hold back the physical retaliation, though verbal retaliation is more prevalent. Um, do you want to speak about that or for our own self-management or when we're receiving that from others? Um, yelling, screaming. I have a list in the new rules of marriage. A, a list of boundary violating behavior. There, there are, it are functional behaviors, which are good. There are dysfunctional behaviors, which are abrasive enough to get you divorced. And then there's outright abusive behaviors, which are worse than dysfunctional behaviors, which are enough to get you divorced to begin with. And possibly abusive, thrown in jail. Uh, possibly. Abusive behaviors are boundary violating behaviors they they uh, are you are overbearing you are intruding on somebody else's boundary and so they include yelling and screaming name calling any sentence that begins with a you are a you mm -hmm. know you're really a slob you know you're really a pig you know you're okay. name calling shaming somebody uh there's a world of difference between i'm angry and you're an idiot yep um, uh, telling an adult what they should or shouldn't do unless asked, telling an adult what they're really thinking and feeling, that's intrusive. You know, you, you say you're mad, but I think you're really, a, what am I, you a therapist? Mm -hmm. you no. Know. Um, and then there are passive violations, lying, being manipulative, making promises and then breaking them. Those are also boundary violations, uh, obviously infidelity. Uh, and you want to take boundary violations off the table. You want to take violence off the table. And you know that a lot, a lot of my work is, is about moving out of violence into nonviolence. Nonviolent yeah. relationship between you and you. Yes. All that negative self-talk, gone. And nonviolent between you and others. You're not yeah. above, you're not below your same as mm -hmm. and this isn't primarily about myself righteously calling you out on what an idiot you are it's about my humbly saying i want to be closer to you i feel pushed away right now right or wrong let's clear the air so i can be close to you again yeah. that's always remember who you are and what you're about and don't get carried away by those little kids inside. <laughs> Send them out onto the playground. Well, when Belinda and I have a fight, and I say this to all my clients, I have a little Terry. I have a composite. He's about eight. I've worked with him for decades. And if Belinda's coming at me, we're both fighters, Belinda and I, so it's rage, rage. Belinda comes at me. I will immediately put little Terry behind me, literally, Wow. I envision my eight-year-old self behind me. Yeah. And I have a deal with him. I say to him, you stand behind me. I will deal with the blast. That 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 blast of anger or indignation or whatever Belinda's thrown our way, it, it will not hit you. I'm like Superman with a cape. Uh, the bottom <laughs> stops here. Okay. You're completely safe back there. That's my part of the bargain. Here's your part of the bargain, little Terry. Shut up. <laughs> you're demoted you're in the back seat it's don't, a good deal little terry you better take it buddy don't you deal with belinda you will make a mess of it let <laughs> me deal with belinda 
I'll deal with you and I'll deal with her. You just stay back there and feel safe. Gorgeous. And I teach people to do literally do that every time they get into a heated moment with their partner. Yeah. The visual is fantastic. Um, you know, Terry, one of my favorite things to do is bring in humor and play, especially even to difficult, challenging situations. And it's got to be a little delicate that it doesn't get misinterpreted or you don't slip into sarcasm, right? I'm curious to know, um, is that something that you bring in uh, in your the moments of conflict or difficulty with Belinda or something you encourage your clients to do? Oh my gosh. I wish I had my wits about me so much that I could be uh, funny. A friend of mine was married to a Zen master. Uh, and I said, what is Poor it like, guy. <laughs> like being married to a Zen master? It was a woman. And, and I said, and Poor she woman. said, well, you can't fight with the son of a bitch. <laughs> And I said, well, give me an example. She said, well, just two weeks ago, we were at the supermarket and I was ragging him out about something that he'd forgotten to do. And I turned to like yell at him and he's not there. And I looked down and he's on the floor kissing my feet. <laughs> and he's saying to me in front of everybody, the whole supermarket is watching this. He said, the problem around here is your feet don't get enough attention from me. <laughs> These are adorable feet and they need attention. How could I stay mad at them? Oh. But I'll give you another one that I love very much. This is my wife, Belinda, who's a genius therapist. A couple came in, couldn't stop fighting, fight, yelling, screaming on three teenage kids and they still couldn't. The one thing that the family agreed on is Motown. They would all sing and dance and play and, and cook together and sing Motown with them. So, okay. So he has a family session, here's about, calls the kids over. Two weeks later, they come back. Here's what happened. Uh, this just gets me every time. They start, the mom and dad started to have a fight. On cue, the kids jump up, all three of them, stand between the two of them and sing, oh, gets me, stop in the name of love. <laughs> and they stopped that's gorgeous hmm. i think the way i sing though might <laughs> make things worse than that. <laughs> might make it even more effective <laughs> you know terry something i learned um about 14 years ago now and i after the my friend told me a story i called it the chicken dance and so it's when um you're upset or angry at something my ego's triggered um, you do something completely arbitrary and out of the normal, like, you know, squawking like a chicken. Quark, 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 quark. And one time I was with this am amazing human being, my partner at the time, and we had gone to a concert. We, we were desperate to find a parking spot. We found one. I said, hop out and I'll drive around and grab it. And when I drove around, there was another car pulling in. <laughs> and I was so mad, so angry. And he gets in the car and he looks at me and, he's, and he just very quietly says, is it time for the chicken dance? <laughs> <laughs> and that's all he had to say. And it was done. So you've renewed or in, in encouraged my, I, I think I'm going to have to do something, a video on just these snippets of examples of bringing in play and humor into love moments it. of tension. Love it. I oh. love it. Wonderful. So Terry, we have a few minutes before we have to wrap up. I'm curious to know if there's anything, you know, and I'm also going to invite you to share a call for action to the listeners. What are the last thoughts you have that you'd like to share today? One of the uh, characteristics of the adaptive child is that it's harsh. It's black and white and relentless and unforgiving and perfectionistic and harsh. And uh, if your listeners get nothing from this conversation, but the point I'm about to make, it will be well spent. And here's the point. There is no redeeming value of any kind in harshness. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that harshness does that loving firmness doesn't do better. Yeah. If it's harsh, it's off. 
soften it up. And that means between you and someone else, it means the way that someone is speaking to you, and it means the way you speak to yourself. Uh, look, I'm an old guy. I'm 71 years old. I just had a birthday. Damn, you're looking great, Terry. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I like to say I'm 85, so I really get happy. <laughs> but, um, anyway, at 71, I have a deal with the universe, Amy. If it's not kind, I'm not interested. Wow. And even if it's me talking to me, I will say to that part of me, because it's the adaptive child part of me, I will say, uh, you may have a point, but find a way of saying it to me respectfully. Yep. You know? Preach it. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. If it's not respectful, uh, take a break and come back to me when you can be. Yeah. Brene Brown says, be clear and kind. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, Terry, oh, this has been such a delightful conversation. I want to share my call for action to listeners, and then we're going to wrap up. So listeners, you're going to want to pick up I have to now read the other two books that Terry wrote, though, for sure, read The New Rules of Marriage. It will have a profound effect on you, even if you apply just a fraction of what he shares in that book. And if you want to connect with Terry, you can check it out, him, check him out on terryreal.com, T-E-R-R-Y-R-E-A-L.com. And Terry, you said that you've got an online course starting next month, which is- Staying uh, in love. Staying in love. And so they'll find that information on your website, right? Uh, they will soon. It's not up yet, but it will be. Okay, good. Listeners, you can be sure to uh, contact me directly at my, on my email, amy at carolcoaching.com. If you want to share your communication challenges and successes, I'll share them on future episodes. Be sure to switch on, listen up, and be inspired next week when I'm going to be speaking with Shauna Shu about up-leveling your leadership. You can check out my website for more information, carolcoaching.com. And if you're game for more, I'm going to be hopping over to Facebook Live five minutes past the hour for a short chat on today's show. Thank you, Terry. It's been a wonderful conversation. It's been lovely for me too. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for all the good work you do. Thanks. And thank you, listeners. You've been listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Happy partnering, everyone. <laughs>